by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Amen. God's elite force. I don't know about you if you have a favorite word or a few favorite words. I know most of us have words that we don't like. I would imagine one of them that probably would be a majority of us that don't like for some reason. Sorry, moist. <laughs> People cringe sometimes. I'm not a big fan of it, but it doesn't bother me too much either. But elite, the word elite, I have always liked that word. And as I began to know what it meant, it, I liked it even more. When I went in the military, it took on another meaning for me, another facet to it. Uh, just yesterday, uh, we had a barbecue for the family over at the house, and as it was kind of wrapping up, we were sitting inside, and uh, I, I don't remember why. Oh, Blake was playing with the baton, and I said, you know, in the Army, they do that with rifles. And so I pulled up a YouTube video with the rifles, and that led to looking at the Navy Blue Angels flying, those guys are elite. The Marines that use the rifles, they have what they call the silent drill. They do all those things as a group in unison and nobody says a word. That takes a lot of practice. They get special ribbons and medals for participating in that because everyone recognizes it takes a lot to be a part of that group. Elite. The definition from the dictionary, a select group that is superior in terms of ability or qualities to the rest of a group or society. If you've ever seen the Air Force Thunderbirds or the Navy Blue Angels fly and do their demonstration, you understand this definition. Probably several of you who in here have, have taken flying lessons. I did that at one point, took flying lessons. I noticed yesterday, and I've seen the, the, the uh, Thunderbirds many times. I grew up around Air Force bases. I don't know how many times I've seen them. But I've watched these pilots fly over the years, and many times their wingtips actually are overlapping. They're not far apart in any sense of the word. Sometimes they're as close as 10 or 15 feet from each other going at hundreds of miles an hour, doing complicated maneuvers. And when we see it from far back, it is impressive, but if you've flown an airplane as a pilot, even a little bit, you are far more impressed. When I was flying, I didn't want to see another airplane in the air, much less have one 15 feet from me. That would have been a big problem. Those guys are elite. They're the very best in the world at what they do. You need to keep that concept in your mind when you think about who you are as God's people. And we need to strive to live up to this definition, to be God's elite force. Think about this. What makes someone elite in your mind? I think of uh, a lot of places and people that are elite. But to your mind, what is it that makes them elite? There's something special about them. They are a person who you look at and think, wow, they are the very best. Cliff divers, the competitive cliff divers. I have watched those guys for years. Down in Acapulco, they jump off those cliffs 100, 120 feet, and they do things on the way down, and they don't land like we would. <laughs> they do it over and over and over, and then climb up and do it again. 
I would probably jump off a cliff once and I may never walk again. I am not an elite cliff drive, diver. Those guys are elite. That's what makes someone elite in our mind is we look at them and go, wow, they do something that almost no one else can do. There's an idea of stages of elite. Someone can be impressive in your mind and be elite, or they could be elite and be mediocre. Now, I've thought of this as someone, you meet someone and they go, well, I'm the president of my own company. That, okay, we're getting there. What's your company? How big is it? Well, it's just me and I mow grass. That's at best a mediocre elite. <laughs> but if someone you got introduced to said, oh, I'm the president of service for Tesla Corporation. Ooh, I would say that. If I met the president of Tesla Sur service department, service organization or division, I'd be like, ooh, that's impressive. If you met Elon Musk, He's, I don't know what he is, he's the president, the board of director, I don't know what he is, but he's in charge of the whole thing. Ooh, that's impressive. If you met the president of General Dynamics, some of you might not even know what company that's, a massive company. There's a company out there called Siemens. You've probably heard of it. It's worldwide, they're everywhere. Ford Motor Company, ooh, that's impressive elite. People that can do those kinds of jobs, that can run a corporation. And sometimes you see people that do that and you figure out they can't. They, you think they're elite and then the next thing you know, oh no, they're not. There is impressive and then there's mediocre. Well, let me introduce you to a painter. I am not an elite painter. I'm going to tell you a story now, and every word of this is true and fairly embarrassing. This is very recent. When we were in Montana a couple weeks ago, we were painting our house. And I was on a three-legged ladder. Some of you might know what that is. Most of them, if they're the ladder that has the legs that step out, there's four. This one only has one in the front. And you can get in tire places. I was on the deck, on the ladder painting the trim along the roof. For you really knowledgeable people, it was the fascia. <laughs> well, I was at the edge of the deck, and there's a rail on the deck, so I stood up with one foot onto the rail. Now, you know where this is going, don't you? I should have known where this was going, but I did not. <clears throat> Everything was fine. I painted the fascia out as far as I could reach. I thought, okay, it's time to get back down and then move around off of the deck. But as I turned to put my foot back on the ladder, my foot slipped. And then that third leg of the ladder slipped. And another leg on the ladder slipped. And I was holding a gallon of paint and a brush. I was only on the second step. That's why I'm alive to tell the story. This really happened in slow motion. After it was over, my brother-in-law, who watched this happen, said, it looked like slow motion. <laughs> and my reply was, Adrian, it was slow motion. <laughs> it started to tip. And my hands were full. And my legs were nowhere I could catch on anything. And a three-legged ladder can fall really slowly. And as I went, I thought, this is going to happen. How much can I not spill? I thought this all the way down. Your mind races, but I had plenty of time because it was going slowly. <laughs> and then this thought, this tells you the, the world we live in today, the technology, what we watch on television. On the way down, I was thinking not about how much is this going to hurt. This is going to be a big mess. I was thinking, I wish there was a video of this. <laughs> I promised I thought that. Because I knew it was going to be epic. <laughs> and it was. 
I fell and I hit the deck and paint went whoosh. And then on me, on the ladder, on the freshly painted house that was not the color of the trim. <laughs> and Lynn came rushing over and said, are you okay? And I said, they couldn't believe I was not hurt at all. I did wind up with a scrape on my back, which I never felt at all. I said, I am perfectly fine. And then we grabbed the water hose, hosed me off, rubbed all over on that, and then we have the next slide. Close up. That's after being washed. I don't own those pants anymore. <laughs> just threw them in the trash. The shirt also, I just threw it away. I, do, I did keep the boots, they're ruined, but they're good for working. I'm wearing new boots today, by the way. <laughs> first time, first time I ever wore them today because of that. But at this, I learned a spiritual lesson in this process, honestly. I thought this after the fact, because we were working hard, working long every day. We're trying to get the house ready to be sold. I'm trying to do things at work. There's a lot going on in my life, and I was just really trying to hold everything together. And when this, it, it hit a pinnacle as this ladder was falling. And I think God may have just done it slowly, so I had time to think about it. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, I was trying to hold everything together, and it just didn't work. It fell all to pieces and made a big mess. Well, we cannot sometimes hold everything together. But God can. And that was the big realization. I thought, I, and I do this over and over. I, I couldn't tell you how many times I've done this in my life and I get caught up in the moment and I'm trying to hold it all together and then something like this happens, and then I realize, oh, I'm supposed to let God do this. Because He's who I work for. I'm on His force. He's in charge. I'm going to let Him do it. And I've tried to do that all my life with people that work for me, or even with my kids. There were times they had difficulties in their life, and they had problems with peer pressure, and I said, blame it on me. I'm your dad. Tell them. My dad said I can't. Just Throw me under the bus. It's okay. Because I don't really care what their friends think. You know. Oh, I do. But their friends seem to cut me more slack than they do sometimes. I, I got along great with my kids' friends usually. And I think part of it was that bearing that responsibility. And accepting their friends for who they were. And letting them be, in a sense, kind of that fringe of our family. God does that with us. He lets us be in the core and the people that we're around. He's willing to welcome them in too. But God can hold it all together. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3, it says, speaking of Jesus, He is the radiance of His glory and the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus holds it all together perfectly. I'm, and I've mentioned this before. I'm, I'm something of a I'm, a, I'm a nerd, I'm a geek. I'm a science fanatic, I guess you'd say. Science just fascinates me. The things in nature that I discover it baffles me that people can continue to study science and claim to be an atheist. It just boggles my mind. I look at science and the world and how it all works, and even these scientists who are evolutionists, they keep getting to a point and they go, and we don't know why this does that. They keep drilling down, looking for smaller pieces, trying to figure it out, and they, they're constantly having to admit, and we don't know why this does that. I know why this does that, because Jesus holds it together. That electrons and protons and neutrons, atoms and molecules, it doesn't make any sense except for the fact that Jesus holds it together by the power of his word. If God turned his back on creation for a split second, it would disintegrate. 
the power behind that, it, it's unimaginable. I like to watch Star Trek, and some of you do too. I've recently been going through the movies again. Again. I don't know how many times that is. 10, 11, 12, 13, 50? I don't know. Lynn would probably say 100. The very first Star Trek motion picture. Voyager has been sent out. 300 later, it's coming back. If you've seen the movie, you know where this goes. But it has amassed all this knowledge and power. And at the beginning of the movie, they encounter this cloud and all these people that are on these incredibly powerful starships of our future with power beyond what we can comprehend are seeing this cloud and they're going, the power is, oh, and they're speechless. God's power is beyond our comprehension. And we should be speechless when we think of it. Jesus holds it all together. In Romans chapter 12, we are told, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Our goal is to be like Jesus. He says, this is our spiritual service of worship. We're in the service. There are other passages over and over that talk about the army of God and that we are to be good soldiers of the Lord. When I was in the military, one of the strangest things I ever saw happen, a couple of guys went to the beach on their weekend leave. They came back very sunburned. So much so they got sick. Had to miss duty for a couple days. Wound up in the hospital. And they got in trouble. Court martial. Both of them. Can you believe that? For going to the beach and getting a sunburn? And their court martial was for destruction of government property. That's when I learned I belonged to the government. When you sign on the dotted line and you become a soldier, you are their property. They tell you what to do every minute of the day. And if you don't think that's true, just try it. Two o'clock in the morning, they feel free to wake you up and make you scrub the floor. Or two in the afternoon, they come and grab you and make you dig holes. And then you fill those holes in and dig different holes. And you ask, why is that? Because I said so, the drill sergeant says. You do what they tell you. You have no choice. Fortunately, I had really good drill sergeants. They understood as a Christian, I was truly devoted to being a Christian. And I would offer when they said, we're going to do this on Sunday. And I would say, can I have a couple hours off to go to church? I'll make up that time somewhere else. I'm not trying to get out of it. I'll make it up. Every time they went, ah, don't worry about it. That was great. But there were other people who tried to manipulate the system, and they could see through that. But if they said you couldn't go to church, guess what? You didn't go to church. Now, you could fight it, and you could probably win, but you are government property, and ultimately, when you've signed in, you do what they tell you. Fortunately, being a soldier of God He's always telling us to do the right thing. And that is our spiritual service of worship, to be like Jesus. So we go back to the scripture we started with. He says, but you are a chosen people. Listen to these words. We should really understand who we are and it and make every effort to live up to it. A chosen people. Chosen by who? By a popular vote? Nope. By your family? Nope. By the whole nation? By the president? Nope. By God. Chosen by God. The one who holds it all together. That should be enough. We should be impressed with who God calls us to be. If he just said, you're a chosen people. 
But he goes on. A royal priesthood. That's really impressive. Just go out and talk to people in the world. What it means to them when you talk about royalty, when you talk about priesthood, they get it. These are special people. They are elite. And we're both a royal priesthood. And we really are. A holy nation. Every nation thinks they're the greatest nation, right? Now, it depends on how you look at it and the statistics you pull. But not always does America. I know this is hard to say on the 4th of July. Not always are we number one. Now, if somebody started chanting we're number one, I'd join you. I think America is a terrific nation, and in most ways it's the greatest nation on earth. But there are other statistics out there that other nations claim they're the best in whatever those might be. Overall, I'd say America is pretty close to the top. However, God says we, His people, are a holy nation. We're the best. Not because we say we're the best, not because of what we do, because of what Jesus did and who God is. We are His elite force. A people for God's own possession. He can have anyone he chooses. He could do anything he would choose to do. He chose to have Jesus come and give his life and those who obey him and turn to him and join his family by adoption are his possession. We belong to God. We are his elite force. Now often we forget right there. If, even if we're at that point, we're like, oh, we're special, we're good, we're God's people, we're wonderful. But there's a purpose to it. The blue angels aren't just the blue angels to sit on the side there in their fancy uniforms by their airplanes and go, look how great we are. They get in their planes and they fly and they prove what they can do because of who they are. We are supposed to do the same thing. So we are all these things so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We have a purpose. And we should be the best in the world at it, of telling people about the excellencies of God. Because once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. There's an image in my mind every time I see the scripture, read the scripture, or hear someone read it. I see chaos before and then that fantastic military order after. People just running every which way, picturing that Black Friday sale when they open the doors and people are just scrambling everywhere. That's chaos. Those people are not a people. They're individuals out for their own. But then, you've all seen these Marines. Now, I was in the Army. I'm going to tell you, Marines can march. Those guys are great. That's a people. And Marines know they're a people. However old a Marine is, walking with his walker or with his cane or in a wheelchair, a Marine is still a Marine, always. They have never forgotten that. They are special. And so are we. Once we were not a people. Look at this group in here. Just by the group we are, we were not a people. But Jesus made us the people of God. <clears throat> at one point, you did not receive mercy. Boy, was trouble waiting for you at the end. We know. We see the descriptions in Scripture of what awaits those who do not fear God and follow His commandments. But now, we have received mercy. I, I really hone in on that, and it makes me crazy, the stuff I hear in the rest of the world. And sometimes we even say it, uh, and we intend well, but it always catches my attention. Oh, you deserve it. I don't ever want what I deserve. Never. <laughs> Never. 
We think we deserve a lot of great things and the people on the commercials tell us we deserve that car and you deserve that vacation and you deserve this and you deserve that. When we look at our performance, we don't deserve anything good. We deserve punishment. We deserve condemnation. But Jesus has given us mercy. In exchange, Scripture tells us, exchanged His performance for ours. We traded records. And God sees us as perfect because of the mercy of Jesus. That is a very powerful Scripture. And we are a very powerful people. Prayer is at our disposal. We always worry, I think of this, people like the, the guy with his finger on the button in Russia, in here, I think China might be, you know, there are a few nations around here that have the nuclear arsenal now. Nothing compared to the power at our disposal when we pray to our God. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. There may be someone here who's not yet in God's elite force. There's not a great test you have to pass to enter. It's strictly a matter of obedience. Obe obedience to the life of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. We follow that form. We die to ourselves, buried in the water, raised to this new life to begin our process of becoming a perfect soldier in the army of God and never to stop being that. Always God's elite force. If you're not in that and you want to do that today, you can have that mercy. You can be a part of God's own possession. And if you'd like to do that today, we offer you that opportunity while we stand and sing together. Mm-mm. <clears throat>